Good morning and welcome to the eStar Resources PLC company update. Throughout this recorded update, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab. Situate in the right corner of your screen, just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. Now I'd like to hand you over to Alex Walker, CEO. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I have to say, it's a real pleasure um, to be speaking to everyone off the back of um, some decent share price appreciation and, and a little bit of liquidity in our shares for the first time in quite some time. So that's a real pleasure uh, to see from the company. It feels like a couple of years worth of, of very serious hard work by by myself and the team is, is starting to uh, be realised by, by the market. So that's um, absolutely fantastic to see. Today, I'd like just to give a relatively short update presentation um, on, on everything that we've been doing as, as ESTAR in Kazakhstan, and uh, then look to get to, to questions fairly quickly. So just a, a summary of, of where we are uh, as a company and, and what we're looking to achieve and how the strategy, I guess, has evolved over, over the last um, 12 to 24 months. Um, still a very, very tight capital structure. You know, I hold just under 10% of the shares on issue with the family office out of Australia, very supportive family office holding just under 17%. I've participated in every capital raise to date. Um, and I'd like to think that we're incredibly incentivized to, to see these uh, share price appreciation and continue to appreciate along with shareholders. The strategy that has been evolving um, has, has now become more of a copper, copper gold focus over the last um, 12 months. And that's principally off the back of, of um, I guess, three major shifts or, or, or two major shifts. One is the success that we've had in, in the East region with the Vakuba deposit um, and, and seeing that turn into a demonstrable asset um, with the potential to get into production. And the second major shift was uh, us being awarded the BHP Explore program in conjunction with, with Chris Van Wick joining as the technical director, which has therefore evolved our third strategy being sediment hosted copper exploration. So what we've got is we've got um, a deposit in Vacoba, some really exciting near-term drillable targets in the East region. And then we've got um, two strategies for tier one size um, copper deposits that we feel any major would be very, very happy to be involved in. Both of which at the moment are costing little to no money um, from ESTAR to develop those strategies and turn them into the reality. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail. Um, but just before we do that, I want to touch base on the copper market because it's actually really integral. And I've been saying this for a little while to understand uh, the copper market dynamics and, and why we think that ESTAR is the best exposure um, to, to ride those dynamics. A few major shifts have happened in the last six to 12 months in, in the copper market. And inherently before those shifts, we've seen um, supply, global supply deficit predictions out kicking in around 2027. Um, largely due to a lack of exploration um, globally and exploration success and an inability to bring new mines into production. We had a few quite significant supply disruptions in the last six months. Some of the name brand ones have been in Peru and Chile with, with um, Cadelco being a, a major producer and not meeting their production targets. Mm -hmm. And also First Quantum having um, their Panama mine uh, Re repatriated, let's say, or appropriated um, by the government of Panama, which has stripped quite a few tons out of the global market. Now we have almost every single major bank um, predicting a, a deficit kicking in this year in 2024. Uh, we've noted there UBS is, is 327,000 tons. And, and just to give you some insight, the prior deficit being predicted in 2027 was the first deficit and that was going to be about 100,000 tonnes. So it's a huge, significant and very fast shift that's happened in, in the copper market. You've got smelters that are under capacity and we've started to see in the headlines that uh, Chinese smelters are starting to shut down. And that's no mean um, feat. It's, it's, it's not an easy decision to make because the shutdown and the restart costs for a smelter are absolutely astronomical. So you only do that if you can see a prolonged period of undersupply of copper concentrate where you cannot meet your production targets and therefore you're running your operation at a significant loss. So making those um, uh, making um, those production cuts is a really significant sign for the supply disruption in the copper market. 
Um, anecdotally, we're also looking at a few other people moving into the space. Obviously, we've got the likes of Newmont and Barrick um, signalling that, that, that they're looking significantly to get into the copper space. And I can talk to that a little bit more in detail, especially when it comes to Kazakhstan. And just making the other point that the only way we're going to solve this um, is, is by discovering new copper mines and putting them into production. The, the deficit is so significant that any technological changes with regards to reprocessing of tailings or processing of, of um, uh, other secondary sulfides and, and things like that is really just adding to, to the marginal supply and, and isn't going to shift this quite significant drastic supply uh, deficit that we see at the moment. And to give you an idea of that, an absolute major tier one mine would be considered over 200,000 tonnes of copper concentrate a year. And today we've got none of those starting up at any time in the near future. And our deficit's already two of those. Um, and that's just going to continue to grow. So whatever happens, please make sure that you've got some copper exposure um, in your portfolio, ideally via Easter. Let's look at Kazakhstan again. Um, uh, I think probably a lot of you are, are, are becoming, if, if um, not already, very familiar with Kazakhstan. We grow increasingly um, happy and confident in Kazakhstan as a jurisdiction. I've now been living here for two and a half years with my family. Our team continues to grow. It's a major, major producer already of, of copper, in particular uranium and gold, and is looking to increase that significantly at the moment. It's got very low operating costs, and an anecdote there is that uh, Kaz Minerals, one of the major copper producers in Kazakhstan, has two quite large porphyry operations here that are running at about 0.3% copper, which is significantly lower than a lot of the major copper mines globally. And yet at 0.3%, they are still in the top quartile in terms of, um, well, I should say the bottom quartile in terms of production costs. So that's a real testament to, to how um, even a, a low-grade uh, copper mine can still be one of the cheapest operators on the planet in Kazakhstan. It's a critical route between China and Europe. Um, it lowers the cost of moving goods between China and Europe uh, by about two-thirds. And so the infrastructure spend and the interest, um, and more important, the political stability of Kazakhstan is an absolute must for uh, the likes of China and the likes of Europe to continue that, that significant trade that it's already undergoing. And we've seen that with the likes of the EU and the UK signing critical mineral supply agreements with Kazakhstan over the last few years, um, thereby you know, reiterating their um, uh, thought process that, that Kazakhstan is a stable jurisdiction to operate in. And we're also seeing an increase in the majors. Uh, Rio Tinto has been here for, for a few years, but has been significantly increasing their land package over the last few years as, as the new mineral law came into uh, effect in 2018. We've had Barrick Gold just starting to enter um, at the moment this year. They start, they've signalled their interest and they've just started to put their infrastructure in place. First Quantum have done the same thing. Glencore have been operating here for quite some time with significant copper and gold mines and Fortescue Metals Group have come in, in in a big way in 2018, actually the same time that, that, um, that Eastar did and also in, in joint venture with Talcan Samruk. Uh, really hope to be putting on there in the not too distant future BHP. Of course, you might be aware that Eastar was a recipient uh, of the BHP Explore Program grant, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation. But in fact, um, two of the six uh, people within that cohort or groups within that cohort are Kazakhstan-based companies. So one third of the cohort is Kazakhstan. So I think that signals BHP's intention to, um, uh, to, to look at this country a lot more seriously. Looking at our first assets in the, uh, in the Rudni Altai volcanogenic massive sulphide belt, our principal asset in this belt is the Vakuba deposit. Well, we've got a number of other really, really exciting targets we're looking forward to getting on with in, in 2024. We uh, spent well in excess of 12 months collecting the data for Vakuba and the rest of the project to the rest of the license area. We spent 12 months processing that data, um, digitizing, analyzing, checking, um, and confirming the results. And that, that resulted in um, March of 2013, uh, a, an exploration chart target, a JORC compliant exploration target of 19 to 23 million tonnes at around one and a half percent copper. Um, within 2024, we drilled that target. We did geological surveys, we did LIDAR surveys, and um, in addition to the other geophysics which we've done in the region. And we've mentioned in the very near future, we'll be looking to put um, a jaw inferred resource on that target. Might be getting ahead of myself just here because I think this slide is, is principally about the infrastructure of the region and why we like it. Um, what's 
absolutely fantastic in, in this part of the world. Um, has been said to me by actually a senior person at, at BHP in the past is what they considered to be infrastructure-led um, exploration. And in many ways, that's actually what ESTAR's intent was in, in the East region. Quite clearly, um, from our own reviews and, and consultation with some of the world's best known uh, geologists, VMS geologists, uh, the likes of Bruce Gamel, who I've referred to in the past, and they've written reports on area. We think that geology is outstanding and the opportunity is outstanding, but you know, one of the most fantastic parts about this region is the infrastructure is very much there. We already have roads, water, power, um, rail on site. And we have two sets of processing infrastructure within roughly 50 kilometres of um, the Vukoba deposit. One, Kaz Minerals Concentrator um, on Nikolovskoy, and the other one is owned by uh, another local company about 50 kilometres to the south. You can see there in um, Belzovskoya. Why is that critical? Well, for, for two reasons. One is it significantly lowers your, your capital costs to get into production um, by potentially the, the hundreds of millions. And the second thing is it increases, well, three things, in fact. The second thing is it increases your um, the speed at which you can put something into production because not only do you not have to, to build those facilities, but in fact, you don't have to do the feasibility work to where you would build them, where your tailings facility would go, and with that, all the additional, additional environmental impact assessments that go with it. So your capacity to move through scoping study, pre-feasibility study, and feasibility study is, I would say, halved um, in terms of the amount of time and the amount of money that that would take to go through that process. So that's really considerable in terms of being able to move your, your project into production a lot faster. And I think largely why we've seen the interest in Vacuba that we have seen. Uh, and last, lastly, um, is the smelter within 70 kilometres. So your tailings facility, concentrate facility and, and, and smelting capacity all within um, 70 kilometres. Speaking with environmental experts, they also tell me that gets us a pretty significant environmental rating when we go into production because we'd have a much, much lower footprint than just about any other operating um, company looking to get into production. I did touch on the Vakuba deposit before, so just a little bit more detail on that. You know, it was no ordinary exploration target when we initially put it out. It wasn't some spurious, well, we've done um, you know, some mapping over an area and there's a few drill holes and we can extrapolate over tens of kilometres to say that we've got a significant size. It was over 42,000 metres went into that original um, uh, exploration target. Um, since then, as I said in the past, we've geo-referenced 70 of those drill holes. We've done a full LIDAR survey, which um, gives us detailed topographical information for mine planning and, and um, uh, the altitude of, of the collar locations, which gives us much more, um, uh, much better detail with regards to the, the quality of this resource calculation. And we've also drilled it ourselves. And typically we got um, similar grades, but, but um, sometimes slightly lower, but much thicker intersections than we had in the historical reports. And that was exactly as expected because uh, the core recovery in the historical reports was much lower. So we would expect to see wider intersections than we had there. So that's very positive um, for the future. We uh, hope to be announcing our Jork inferred resource in the next one to two weeks. A little bit more on the exploration of the East region. I've mentioned before that, that we've been updating our targets and it's several years worth of work to get to this level. Um, it's a review of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of kilometres of historical drill data, um, including geophysics as well, soil sampling. Um, we've had to send our own teams out to review uh, a lot of these targets. We did quite a significant heliborne electromagnetic survey to help develop um, about 48 of our own targets over this area. And then we needed to methodically go through all those 48 targets, uh, including field work, ground truthing and so on, to start ranking them um, as, as potential targets for us to drill in the future. And we're at that stage right now. Um, we expect uh, at the moment there's at least five priority one targets for us. I would hope that three of those can be converted, a minimum of three of those can be converted to drill targets this year. And so what we expect to see is three very, very high impact drill campaigns over the course of 2024 for new targets within this very um, uh, interesting region and infrastructure rich region. So we're really looking forward to taking those, uh, those forward. A little bit about the BHP Explore program. So more than 500 applicants applied for this program and uh, uh, ESTAR was one of six that were awarded, um, uh, awarded the grant. 
it's a fantastic program. It's very, very intense. Um, it's easy to look at it as just a $500,000 grant from BHP to which they don't receive any shares. Um, uh, but what they do is they also put us through quite a rigorous um, uh, training program just from a, from a technical perspective um, through their mineral systems framework, which Chris Van Wick, our um, technical director, is leading, but also through a management um, training scheme as well. So part of my almost every week is um, management training with very senior people and ex-people from BHP, leadership training, um, health and safety training, risk analysis and so on. The concept here is very much that BHP want to get um, each company within the program ready for an investment with BHP. And to, to not take words out of my mouth is, is we've put a quote in here from Charlie Johnson, who's the head of the program, saying we look at the projects, the operating jurisdiction, the teams, and then ultimately the likelihood that the opportunities will yield a follow-on investment in the portfolio. And we bring in projects that we think are set up for a future with BHP. So a huge part of my focus for the last three months has been uh, getting Eastar ready for for that discussion, for that investment. Um, we've got the BHP team coming to site later on this month. Um, so we've got a week of, of meetings with them here of analysis and review of the work that we've done to date in the company and so on, and demonstrating our capacity to not only execute programs um, well and efficiently and in a safe manner, but to scale up um, quickly as well. And I think that's a really integral part of, of, um, of being able to operate with someone the likes of BHP. We've got our first two licences awarded within that program, Aogos and Snowy. Um, we've obviously done our initial site visits for those prior to their applications last year with Chris, Chris and his team. And we'll be looking to progress those this year as well with soil sampling campaigns starting hopefully in the not too distant future, which will be the first, first part of um, the de-risking of those licences. Um, so we would expect that to start um, ideally in May. We haven't really talked about the set hosted copper strategy at the moment and we won't go into it in, in too much detail because we consider the work um, that we're doing proprietary but a little bit about why we're looking for set hosted copper in kazakhstan really this has been led by by chris um, uh, for those that read the announcement when chris joined the team amongst uh, a huge amount of his prior experience one of his key roles was the head of set hosted copper exploration for first quantum minerals so he actually developed the targeting strategy for set hosted copper exploration for first quantum um, now currently they're in kazakhstan looking for set hosted copper um, using using those targeting uh, mechanisms which he developed um, it's a very, very interesting uh, place to, to, to be looking. You've got um, the, the basins of Chuso Su and Tennis Basin being the biggest in the world in terms of said hosted copper basin, and it hosts, it hosts the third biggest said hosted copper deposit in the world in Jeskaskan, which is 22 million tonnes of contained copper. So to give you an idea of that, um, anyone would consider a tier one copper deposit uh, comfortably being 5 million tonnes or more. So these are significant. And more often than not, they're very, very high grade as well. So we're really excited by the strategy. We've unequivocally got the right, right team for it with Chris leading the charge. Uh, the work with GE Tech initially, the targeting work means that it's a very, very low cost option for us. Um, but it really does show the potential for us to have another tier one um, uh, portfolio uh, or, or, or uh, another tier one um, approach to discoveries in the not too distant future. And, and just to be clear, the people already looking for said hosted copper specifically in Kazakhstan includes First Quantum, Fortescue, um, Rio and BHP being through the other party that, that were in the Explore program. Um, the, the private company that's part of the Explore program have a set hosted copper um, uh, attachment. So four global majors all looking for set hosted copper in Kazakhstan. Um, can't be wrong. Well, hopefully. So where are we um, in the short term and the medium term? Uh, at the moment, we've got the exploration target on for Kuba. We've got our initial porphyry targeting strategy that we're working through with BHP and the program lasts until June this year. And we've got our initial sediment hosted targeting strategy with uh, GE Tech. Within about a month, um, we expect to be announcing our jork inferred resource. As I said, in the next one to two weeks, hopefully our jork inferred resource on for Kuba. Uh, we'll be providing additional detail on, on on the rest of our targets as the field season starts and, and looking to confirm those and get those um, drill ready and, and hopefully drillable sooner rather than later. So there'll be lots of field teams out um, 
for the east region and also field teams out for um, the said copper and for the porphyry exploration um, not just the soils in uh, for the two awarded licenses but ground truth in the additional targets which um, is work that we continue to undertake both with um, GE Tech and, and doing hyperspectral imagery and, and the sort of uh, uh, first principles um, geological analysis that that's, that's done to assess these targets. And so where could we be in 12 months? Um, well, uh, uh, we expect to be putting a scoping study or pre-feasibility study on Vakuba. Um, we have drilled three plus targets, VMS targets, any of which could be uh, you know, considered game-changing targets as well for ESTAR. Additional porphyry and said hosted copper licenses. And I've put a question mark next to new joint ventures because I said at the start of, um, certainly at the start of this year, end of last year, that I think it's very realistic that ASTAR is having between one and three joint ventures um, by the end of 2024. And I still stand by that today. Um, I think we've got enough on our plate to really demonstrate the capacity to, to, um, uh, to achieve those results. We've started this process to farm out um, for COBRA, which I'm, I'm happy to talk to probably via the questions. Um, but uh, that's just one of, of uh, at least three that we can see um, uh, being a part of, of, of the potential for East Star in 2024. So it's a really exciting year for us. There we go. Um, the quote from me, as I've said in the past, there are a few places in the world where a Western mineral framework meets lower operating costs and a progressive attitude towards developing resource projects. Um, East has already definitively uh, demonstrated our exploration success, both in Fukuba and, and the other uh, parts of the portfolio. And now we really hope to, to be able to progress that to tier one discoveries, hopefully in partnership with some major companies that will uh, be bringing some, some real funding um, prowess to the company. So we're really excited to, to be presenting this opportunity to you guys. And, and we're really pleased for those of you who are shareholders that you're coming along for the journey. For those of you who aren't, I'm very happy to answer questions to, um, you know, to ensure that you can. But if there's three things I really want you to take away fr from today is um, we're incredibly motivated to achieve these results. First of all, you've got um, a, a copper thematic that is absolutely not going away and is not going to be resolved by anything other than major discoveries. You have uh, BHP, well, BHP hopefully in the not too distant future, Rio Tinto, First Quantum, Fortescue Metals Group and other major groups all coming into Kazakhstan in a big way because they feel that this is the place where those next tier one discoveries can be made and the place that will provide the stability to get those projects into production over the longer term. And you've got ESTAR resources with a proven track record of being able to efficiently execute exploration programs in Kazakhstan and already had um, significant due diligence from the likes of BHP, which provides some um, uh, a level of validation for our exploration team and our management team. And we hope to continue to reiterate, reiterate that, um, that validation to, to you guys and, and the market over the, uh, over the near term. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. We really appreciate the support to date and uh, we can move on with questions. Perfect, Alex, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Just so Alex takes a few moments for you, those questions <clears throat> today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed by your investor dashboard. Alex, as you can see, we have received a number of questions, both pre-submitted and throughout today's live event. If I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it is appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Certainly, thank you. Um, I'll read all of the questions that have been submitted, whether or not I can answer them in full in, in full or as much as uh, has been requested, I'm not sure. So I'll do it in order of, of, of how they've been received and presented to me. Um, the first question is, what steps do you plan to take to develop Atmintas? And would you be able to provide some context to the grab samples taken there, 1,214 and 4,484 grams per tonne gold, please? Do you expect those samples to be representative of what is underground there? Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Certainly we did excuse me, when we first went in to explore um, that part of the Upman Tass licence. So we had a, a series of his pieces of historical data. Um, and in fact, the picture that you see in front of you is me looking over that Novo pit. Um, and, and right in the background, you can see a hole, uh, or you know, as we consider an adit, but um, from artisanal workings, um, uh, where people were, were still 
doing the odd piece of illegal mining over the, over that area where those grab, grab samples were taken. We drilled um, RC on that uh, initially in, in 2021 and uh, got one particularly good drill hit. Uh, people might remember it shortly after we listed. Um, it was two metres at 131 grams per tonne gold. And over the course of 19 metres, I think it averaged out to about 50, or just under 15 grams per tonne gold. Uh, we went back there with a diamond rig to um, to confirm the continuity and try and intersect those ore bodies again and weren't successful. And so our thesis on that particular part of the Upman TAS licence was that it is uh, a very, very difficult, potentially very high grade, but very, very difficult um, ore body, likely pinching and, and, and swelling, um, but difficult to try and drill and turn into a deposit of any meaningful size for a listed company. So it's the sort of thing that you would think maybe the old prospectors might want to get stuck into, um, but unlikely to be something that that ESTAR itself will will continue to chase on that part of the Upmintas deposit. If a Cuba was to be sold, what kind of terms could you expect? Um, I'd, I'd love to give you a little bit more information on, on what's being discussed, um, but unfortunately we consider that market sensitive. What I would say is that there's a couple of... Um, key points I'd like to make here. We've, we've maintained for some time that Fukuba as an asset is worth considerably more than ESTAR um, in its current market capitalisation. And so we don't intend on doing a deal that does not um, agree with that, with that philosophy. This isn't about cost cutting. This isn't about um, taking Fukuba off our books. This is about realising value for shareholders. So we want to see a deal that, that looks like that um, and we want to maintain um, uh, exposure to the production of Fukuba, whether that's as a reasonable percentage um, of, of uh, ownership or whether that's as a, as a decent NSR, uh, net smelter royalty, which represents a reasonable percentage of ownership. So either way, we would want to make sure that we maintain access to the potential near-term cash flow of Fukuba, as well as realising the value of the asset in, in a significant way um, in terms of cash components and, and otherwise. Um, that's probably all I can say with regards to value uh, on that at the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there a plan in principle that potential deposits under the Explore scheme uh, can be drilled before the presentation to BHP at year end? Uh, so firstly, the BHP presentation will be in June, um, and the answer is no. We won't. It's it's almost impossible, I think, for us to to um to be drilling those targets at that point in time. But it's probably a very good point to reiterate that that's actually not um not the point of the the program. Um, you know, we're not presenting to BHP two targets um, that we've pegged that we're going to progress as much as possible and have to present a discovered porphyry. What we're presenting to BHP is a, a detailed um, understanding and analysis of the entire um, belt within this region. So at the moment, it's over 200,000 square kilometres. It's, it's considered part of the, um, the AOI, um, the area of interest. You know, we are doing uh, back using BHP's mineral systems framework, we're uh, applying that to this entire belt to really, really understand, you know, the potential of this belt and, and which targets um, in terms of silica litho caps or otherwise, but which porphyry targets might um, be of BHP size. And then what I hope to do is present a, a number of targets to BHP and say, this is how we would intend on progressing over the next two years. These are the targets we would go after. This is the budget and looking to, to form that into a more meaningful um, joint venture. Uh, of that, Snowy and Aogaz might be might be two of those targets, but I expect them to be two within a portfolio of, of, of additional targets. So that's not the catalyst we're looking for. That's not the catalyst BHP specifically is looking for. Um, what we would hope to be presenting is a number of targets that will be drillable over the coming years. Uh, if something exciting or novel turns up, is there a facility for BHP to move quicker? Um, yes, there is. And I don't think that's specific to do with exciting or novel. I think it's specific to do with both ESTARS and BHP's readiness uh, to, to close that, that, um, that transaction. From what I understand, you know, part of the, the, the visit when they come here is to redo their new country assessment. So BHP currently doesn't have a... Um, an office or in in, um, in Kazakhstan, so it needs to go through a series of um, uh, a series of assessments and protocols before it gets signed off 
at the top level, literally at the top level, um, to ensure that they can continue to invest in Kazakhstan. So that's the process they're going through at the moment. Um, and I see that as, as one of a couple of hurdles. But ultimately, if BHP is ready and ESTAR is ready and we can uh, come to a mutually agreed structure, then there's nothing to stop that happening faster um, than, than June and certainly the end of the year. Um, but we'll see how that plays out. We still have to get through the, um, the new country assessment first. Will we hear about the Telescope prospects soon? I certainly hope so. Um, we've ultimately been waiting for the field season to start, which is roughly now, in fact, we're getting a little bit of rain, as, as you might have seen in papers. Thankfully, it's not affecting any of our assets and we've had people traversing a lot of the country um, the last couple of weeks, which we've been able to do absolutely fine. Um, however, uh, the real sort of, uh, you know, completely clear get access to all of the ground with ease is it really kicks in in May. So we would hope to have our field teams out in May. At that point in time, we'll be doing, um, I hope, quite regular updates to the market in terms of um, just social media updates. This is what's happening. This is where people are on the ground, but also just reaffirming those targets, um, understanding exactly where the drill calls might be. If there's any additional work that needs to be done prior to drilling, uh, for example, potentially additional IP surveys um, or MAG surveys or EM surveys, then we'll be able to undertake that very quickly before doing that targeting. So I certainly hope we'll be talking about Telescope again in the very near future as one of those four or five targets I mentioned previously. Has the desktop assessment of likely, sorry, has the desktop assessment of likely other local but unknown VMS deposits in the same system been matched with field work? Uh, or is that the plan for 2024? I'm not sure I completely understand the, the question, but um, potentially what we're referring to is, is uh, just a comparison of, of our deposit versus the other deposits in the region. Um, so yes, we are undertaking this work. In fact, we sampled 16 deposits, uh, of both current operating and past operating deposits last year, including going underground at some of the operating mines, Artemyevsky, uh, taking samples from the waste piles of the likes of Nikolovskoy and, and <clears throat> excuse me, a number of the other open pits that, that are across the region. So the idea here is, is that we take samples from uh, from those deposits and first of all, confirm that they're VMS deposits by their, by their lithogeochemical fingerprint. And secondly, confirm the horizon that they were developed in by um, uh, ideally sampling the foot wall and the hanging wall, but principally the foot wall to get the geochemical signature of, of um, the foot wall uh, mineralization looking at the alteration and, and and what is the fingerprint of, of that foot wall alteration so we have been doing that we continue to do that and in fact we've um, been discussing with casmirals who've given us approval to visit all of their mines again so we'll be doing that in may going underground at lovskoy adamyevsky and otiski um, and definitively sampling those locations and then what that gives us is a really detailed database to compare our, our deposits to uh, the hope with some of these other targets in the region is is we might have been able to confirm that it's got an EM anomaly and an IP anomaly and it looks quite good from a geophysics perspective. We've found some rocks at surface that look very, very similar in terms of alteration, but we just want to confirm that it's in the same horizon because that will help our ranking and our, our ranking of those targets and our confidence in those targets prior to drilling. I hope I've answered that question, but please submit again if, 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 um, if that wasn't quite what you were after. What is the plan for any drilling in the wider Rudney Altai H1? And so, uh, and where and how much from current funding um, specifically? Uh, H1, I think, will be a push for the other targets in, in Rudney Altai. I expect that we'll need a couple of months in the field to, to confirm those targets. So, firstly, I'd like, I'd, I'd probably suggest that they're likely to be H2, um, hopefully early H2, that we'll be, uh, that we'll be drilling those targets. How, how much? Well, that's a good question. If, if we have three targets, most of these are relatively shallow, first of all. So um, principally what you're doing is you're doing one drill hole initially, which is over, which is quite well pinpointed, either via ground EM or, or, or IP. And then if that target hits um, massive sulfides, then fantastic. You can immediately start following up without other drilling. And if it doesn't, then typically you do downhole EM. So if we're talking about three 
um, or four drill holes that are only um, 200, 250 metres each. It's at very, very little expense at 100, and, let's say 110 metres a drill hole. You know, you're, you're talking like a very, very cheap um, program. And in fact, the drill rig we used from last year is still sitting at site. So I wouldn't expect any mobilisation costs either, um, unless it gets uh, redistributed before we start. So that is a very, very low cost program that we can comfortably afford today. Uh, should shareholders factor any value of the rare earth project into the share price or is that now worthless? Um, it's a good question. I, I think worthless is, is um, not the right word I would be using, but my view would be that the risk reward um, for ESTAR has changed quite drastically. The, the rare earth project we were very excited by initially, we obviously had um, what I consider to be, and almost anyone would consider to be a global rare earth expert as one of the founders of the company, Dr. Rainer Elmies. We did uh, very, very low cost cheap work to, to de-risk what was a known deposit. Um, we did the deal, we um, uh, drilled fantastic drill results and the metallurgical test work was not what you would hope for to move um, quickly through uh, a process of converting it to a joint resource and, and, and going through a scoping study and trying to understand your processing mechanisms. Um, so the deposit still has life attached to it, but the risk in, in the metallurgy is higher than where, where it was when we started. My feeling is the risk to East Star is also considerably higher than when we started um, because it was drastically um, under, even though we spent less than $100,000 on it, we lost quite a lot in market value at the time when we announced it, which was quite unfortunate. So my, my personal view, and I believe the board's view is the risk of us continuing with that deposit is um, is probably not worth the expenditure. And then you've also got the added issue of um, management time and effort. It's it's complex, it's different. Um, whereas we've now got quite a, uh, you know, a strategy focused on copper, on tier one deposits, um, or on deposits that can be monetized via production in a commodity that's a lot less opaque. So I think for us, um, the, the rare earths is, is gonna be difficult to continue with. Um, you know, we'll, we'll assess, but I think for us, it's gonna be continued to, to um, uh, I, I would hope that the existing holders or someone else can come and, and progress that further. I certainly know Kazakhstan is very keen on, on rare earths. President Tokayev seems to talk about it quite a lot. Um, thank you for the presentation. Appreciate all the hard work. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I have recently invested and caught one of your past presentations where you were quite puzzled on the share price at the time. <laughs> Given the potential in the market demand we could be in, what are your thoughts around the share price today? Do you still feel the company's potential is not being mirrored by the current share price? Um, that's that's a, uh, a good question. Do you still feel the company's potential is not being mirrored? Yeah. Um, yes. Absolutely, I do. Um, I mean, to be fair, I don't think you'll find a, a CEO who doesn't say that, to be absolutely clear. However, um, I think I've made it quite clear, particularly with regards to the likes of the, the Vakuba deposit, but we feel the value of that deposit is a, is a significant multiple on, our, on today's share price, even. Um, and, you know, those numbers have been demonstrated with third party assessments that, that have been publicly released to the market. Now, I know that you don't get the full NPV valuation of, of a project, you know, at least until it's in production. I know that there's capital costs and risks associated with that and, and additional discounts that should be applied on those net present value calculations to, to, um, to, to warrant those risks and warrant that time. Um, but in my view, that's far more significant than the value of our company today. So I would say on Vakuba alone, we're undervalued. And I would also say that, um, you know, if you look at the potential of the rest of the portfolio, VMS discoveries, um, potential partnerships and joint ventures with with um, uh, Porphyry Exploration and so on, that I'd argue we should we deserve uh, an additional enterprise value for those. Comfortably argue an additional enterprise value for those um, uh, f for those potential projects. So, uh, yes, is the answer. I do feel like we're undervalued, and um, I'm going to keep working hard to make sure that uh, you know that that. Um, I let everybody know that and, and let everybody know the value that we'll continue to, to try and achieve for our shareholders. Next question, some media reporting potential issues in the country, the country may face with so-called invasion attempts. Do you feel this could be, have an impact on the share price with investors being cautious to invest? Um, I, I can't say I know much about the concept of, in, of invasion attempts. Um, I can, I presume you might be referring to Russia, although I have to say, um, I, I think the odds of that are, are 
I, I think it would be easier for me to win Lotto. Um, so I'm not feeling particularly worried. I'm here with my wife and my two young children and um, have no intention of leaving anytime soon and nor do any of our friends. Uh, Kazakhstan is an incredibly secure place to, to, to be, to operate. They've had to be um, an unbelievably diplomatic country being quite a small population um, and, and ultimately underfunded post, um, uh, post the Soviet Union class for quite some time. Um, but the borders of, of the country have been that way for, for quite a long period of time. And you've got, um, uh, you've got you know, Russia to the north, you've got China to the east, and you've got Europe to the west. Um, and there's no doubt that, that all of those um, uh, major, major players are vying for influence in Kazakhstan because of its strategic nature. But I think President Tokayev has done an unbelievable job um, in, in being very diplomatic on that front and, and um, uh, weighing up his, his, um, his support, um, obviously not angering any particular party, but, you know, even after Russia did invade Ukraine, um, uh, you know, Kazakhstan said that, we, that, that and President Tokayev said that he sticks by the NATO standards and, and recognises those regions as belonging to Ukraine. Um, and even after all of that, the UK and the EU sign MOUs for critical mineral supply. Um, President Xi Jinping, Kazakhstan was the first visit he did after COVID. So this was back in 2022. And he stood in the Kazakhstan parliament and said, we will defend Kazakhstan's sovereignty and its borders um, uh, if necessary. And I, I don't believe that to be a particular threat, but I believe it to be uh, a comment as to how they feel about um, about uh, protecting this, this quite significant nation state. So I don't believe that that's a, uh, a particular issue. I do think that in the Western world, there is a, a general comment of the stands um, and that's something which, which uh, I, I don't think should be attributed to Kazakhstan personally. Um, you know, it's far more advanced than, than all of its neighbours in that, in, that, um, in that field in its, uh, in its licensing um, of subsoil, its application of subsoil law, its application of um, of uh, setting up things like the Astana International Finance Centre to, to help bring in um, foreign investment. And they're incredibly foreign direct investment focused. So I'm feeling very, very good about Kazakhstan. I think, um, I think it's, it's an education factor and, and it's the same thing that not all African countries should be lumped into one. Um, there's no doubt that Kazakhstan sits head and shoulders above, above the rest in terms of its investability in, uh, in Central Asia. Could you give as much clarity as possible on your cash runway given current activities and how that integrates with the farm out strategy? Uh, look, we'll be announcing our annual report in the next, uh, hopefully the next week, um, maybe a, a touch longer, and that'll give you our current um, capacity. Uh, I'll, I'll say that you know, we find we don't have um, uh, you know, a necessity for cash um, and you know I expect to have all of the regular um, uh, caveats with regards to going in concerns and so on, but I, I'm, I'm certainly not expecting to um, to worry the market with any uh, uh, short-term capital requirements. We've still got the other couple of tranches of the BHP money coming through, and we obviously raised money in October last year, so we're well and truly okay for our, um, our cash runway for, for the foreseeable future and our current work program. Along with the potential for Cuba transaction, there's more questions coming. Thanks, everyone. Along with the potential for Cuba transaction, are there any potential measures to address the value disconnect of ESTAR's market cap and portfolio value? Um, yes, doing more invest make company um, presentations, I think certainly helps. Uh, you know, having, having had a, a, certainly some interest over the last week or two, the feedback from um, brokers and market makers and so on to me is there's been a renewed, uh, not a renewed, probably a first um, real interest in, in ESTAR demonstrated by liquidity and uh, the, the retail market getting involved in our company. So I very much want to see that continue. Uh, we've got our annual report. We've got our, um, uh, our uh, jaw inferred resource, both in the next couple of weeks. Um, we are looking, you know, we're constantly looking at, at other ways to, um, uh, you know, to, to help promote or help rep demonstrate that, that value. And we'll continue to do that. I think part of that is our uh, company strategy and part of that is our communication strategy, which is perpetually under review. I think people have seen some changes in that <clears throat> even over the last few months. So, um, yes, we'll continue to work on that. There are things that, that may land that I can't, um, you know, until they do, we aren't going to be able to talk about. So 
Um, I think there's more than enough um, value in the company today and catalyst going forward to give people a reason to be very, very interested in ESTAR for 2024. Thank you for all the insights in the area. Situation of the truly gold areas also on the back burner relative to your couple of projects and initiative. The answer is yes, uh, despite the fact that the gold price is going up considerably. Um, the reality for us is that we, uh, when you are relatively capital constrained as, as a junior company, you need to, let, for the sake of a better term, pick your battles. Um, I think the admin task license is fantastic. Uh, I think that shows real, real potential for um, uh, for a significant gold asset. But it, ultimately, it's still early stage exploration. We'd need to be applying, um, you know, quite a few investment dollars to to uh, test 10 kilometres of strike. Um, and I would love to see that done. But when it comes to allocating capital there versus potentially drilling for Cuba or testing a couple of admittedly also early stage, um, but nonetheless, uh, VMS targets within our East region licenses, the capacity to put those into production on success is very, very high. Whereas at Mintas, um, uh, for us, we'd need to make the discovery and then put that into production likely ourselves. So for me, that is uh, a license that's really okay. interesting, but ultimately uh, today, and I would argue, for, you know, unless something quite drastically changes with regards to our access to and cost of capital, for 2024 will probably stay on the back burner, um, but we'll, you know, we'll perpetually revisit and review, um, you know, what's appropriate to spend on these licenses and when. And I think that's the last one. Perfect, Alex. Thank you very much for answering those questions from investors. And of course, the company can review all the questions submitted today, and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. Alex, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Certainly. Well, once again, uh, for all of you, for, for long-term shareholders, I really, really appreciate your patience. Um, you know, I've invested in the IPO at, at 5p. Um, along with you, I, I was in the last round at 1.5p. And so I can understand that, that often these things are more difficult and take longer than we initially hope and expect. So we really recognize that we work incredibly hard to to make sure that um that the money is going into the ground that we're building that, that value for shareholders and then of course the second part of that strategy is letting everyone know that we've built that value and, and really getting that um that understanding across to the market for me it feels like that's that's starting to happen for our company finally and, and i have no um uh, uh no interest in, in letting that momentum stop and so we'll keep pushing forward on that front um, to help you uh, to help you realise that value, and, and, and hopefully you know we'll all have some success in the not too distant future. Um, but uh, but but three words quite simply is um, is copper, uh, is Kazakhstan, and Easter. And I think the three of those combined um, is is a really good um, uh, perspective on, on on how to get some leverage and some alpha into your portfolio for 2024. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Perfect, Alex. Thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session, as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team for Eastar Resources PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.